On mic today, we have Richard Bergen. How are you doing today, good sir? I'm doing very well, Aaron. Thanks for having me on your show. I couldn't wait because when I heard that you were into offbeat and independent cinema, I like, all right, I got to talk to this guy. So you are the director of a horror film? I am, yes. I was about to say that not only am I into offbeat independent cinema, I make it too. That's that's amazing because that's what we're all about here. People who are so driven by what they're into that they actually go ahead and get into it in some way, shape, or form. So how did you get started? Well, it's well, basically, well, at first I'm going to say a little bit about the movie that I'm almost done making. The movie okay. is Fang. It's a psychological horror film. It's the story of a young man named Billy Cochran. He is a janitor who lives with his mother in this kind of this gritty neighborhood in Chicago, and he has undiagnosed autism, so he feels very disconnected for the people around him, very kind of isolated, lonely guy. So one night, Billy wakes up in the middle of the night, you know, he he has to go to the bathroom, and then this rat jumps out at him from the bathroom and bites him, and then from that point forward, Billy imagines that he's transforming into a rat, and I'm I'm not going to give any spoilers about whether this is all in his head or if it's really happening or where we go from there, but... So how I got started is, well, I started writing the script in March of 2019, and that took about five months, and then we started, and then we filmed the movie in January and February of this year, and in November, we're going to have our online premiere, so it's it's been a long process, but a lot of different steps along the way. Actually, I would say I'm very impressed with how much time you put into it because I I've known a lot of independent filmmakers and they a lot of them make the mistake of trying to get it right out the door. They don't go through the process and you seem to have taken your time and tried to do things right. Whether it works out or not, I won't know till I see it, but I respect the effort. Oh, well, thank you, uh, Aaron. I, it's funny because my first instinct is to kind of like rush things and get things done quickly but then my perfectionism and my obsessive compulsive nature takes over and i have to do things right so that it ends up taking longer anyway and and that is a danger too is that the the people who obsess over every little point that they don't actually get anything done at all independent film is it's a double-edged sword You, you can't have one way or the other you have to have that balance absolutely yeah you have to you have to take everything into consideration at all times, mm-hmm. which is why I have an ample collection of sleeping pills in my <laughs> kitchen cabinet for uh, when I need to go to bed because it's it takes a lot of brain power sure. at all times. <laughs> and and I'm sure that you're using those responsibly, but I'm, I'm glad you I have am. I am. Most of the time. Well, I, I don't judge. I'm just saying. I, you seem to be know. a good guy. Um so I will not get into spoilers. That's that's not the business I'm in. But I find a lot of interesting things about that story, and I'm very, very much looking forward to following along and seeing if I can figure out what's real, what's not. Uh, the idea of using an autism spectrum protagonist is great. Oh, thank uh, you. Because, you know, you're looking at somebody who already has trouble perceiving the world the way the rest of us do or, or the way the bulk of people do. And you're adding into that a horror element, an uncertainty element. And yeah, because now I'm wondering, is this an issue of the person's condition? Is it an issue of something fantastic or just a really bad set of circumstances? It could go either way. Oh, yeah. Well, to be honest, you know, people ask me before, you know, what is what does this all mean? What does Fang mean? And then my answer is always. I don't know. I just try to, you know, I, I get these ideas and then I try to channel them. And then I think about what it means after the ideas have already struck me. But one thing that I've sort of come to see as the meaning of Fang is that the rat transformation is kind of a metaphor for the experience of people with autism and other disabilities. Because when, you know, especially when you have a disability that is is very social in nature that makes you socially excluded from other people, then, you know, then you can kind of start to feel like you're a rat. 
in some sense, mm. you're this creature that has been cast out from the mainstream of humanity and you're kind of on the margins of things and sometimes mm-hmm. you feel like you're kind of trapped and you're on your kind of little wheel scurrying around and like in a, in a rat cage so i think that's kind of how that's kind of why the idea has stuck with me for this long and why it was always paired with you know the personal life of, of billy and you know that whole connection between the two i think is the heart and soul of thing so who did you work with on this movie who became your your writing crew your actors well i i wrote it myself okay and uh the actors we i i got really lucky with the casting on all fronts we had some really terrific actors in this uh movie the lead actor who played Billy was Dylan LeRae, and I found wow. him just by doing in, you know, I put out an ad on uh, Backstage.com for the auditions to play the main character, and what really made Dylan stand apart with his audition is that, you know, he, like, you know, when you, when you see the auditions, most of the actors, you know, they want to do the monologue, they want to show this range of emotions. They want to show how they're acting, exclamation point. But then Dylan really captured the nonverbal aspects of Billy. He had really good facial expressions and movements. And even though I couldn't quite articulate it right away, that's what really that's what really stuck with me the most. And that's mm-hmm. why I ultimately gave him the role of Billy. That speaks a lot to his talent. I haven't seen the movie yet. I don't know the guy, but I mean, that's a lot of actors would, like you said, be looking for the place where they can throw the emotional range and really sink their teeth to the scenery, as it were. Absolutely. And, yeah. Are you a fan of the show Big Bang Theory? Not to go sideways by any chance. I haven't really watched it too much. Okay. I've seen a little of it. Well, uh, the actor Jim Parsons, who plays Sheldon, has been apparently arguing with the writers throughout the whole series as to whether his character is autistic. Um, the writers say, no, 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 he's just a quirky guy, he's kind of a nerd, and Jim Parsons is like, no, he's totally autistic, and that's how I play him. <laughs> so, and, and he's a well, great so that's actor. Well, there's a thin line between the two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But but Jim Parsons is a good actor. He does a great job with that character, and he's embracing his interpretation of it, which is autism. Now, you can say, well, does the actor own the character? Do the writers own the character? Different conversation for a different day. But that's that's something you're you're hammering home in this movie. Oh, that's that's true. Well, I do think that, you know, the like, you know, I have high functioning Asperger. So I'm at the very high end of the autism spectrum of my own life experiences were definitely very influential for the writing and direction of thing but i do think that you know for based on all the research i've done about the history of it a lot of these diagnoses are, are pretty recent you know people were not widely diagnosed with asperger's or autism until like the 1990s so before that you know you would have just been a nerd and mm-hmm. that would have been the end of it. They wouldn't have said anything more. But now we have many more labels and, you know, terms and medical conditions that we understood that we just thought were personality quirks before. So I, I could see kind of both sides of that argument there. Okay. And you see, I, I just look at it and, you know, knowing many people on the spectrum – I look at Sheldon. It's like, okay, that's that makes sense to me. I, I didn't really humor the writers on that. I'll be honest with you, because I, I'm of the opinion that you know, a lot of times with TV shows, the actors kind of focus takes over because they have it. So, yeah, I, I can. What well, he's been see playing that. the character for years, that it becomes a much, you know, becomes a very intense attachment. With the movie, it's a little bit different because we filmed Fang in 23 days. So we we kind of, you know, we got we had to get the characters down before we even started filming. Whereas with a long running TV show, then you have time for the the character and the writers to really evolve over the years and reach kind of new understandings of everything. That 
Yeah. Um, and if you were to ever revisit that character, I mean, you, you have the groundwork now, but like you said, you had to come across it in a very short period of time. So is there a certain, you said your experiences, your life experiences helped create this movie. Is there a certain one you'd like to reflect on? Well, it's kind of, I think, the best way I could describe how it feels to be like on the very high-functioning end of, of the autism spectrum is that it's kind of like there aren't that many big things that you go through that are like, you know, this is what it means to be disabled, exclamation point. But it's more like a bunch of little things that you experience on a regular basis, like where you kind of make like little mistakes or gaffes when you're in like a social situation and that's you know that's something that everybody does to some degree but mm -hmm. then I think you know I do it more than normal and then I and then that kind of bothers me and then I think about it and I start to get paranoid about making these mistakes and worrying you know am I acting in a way that is not going to get me in trouble in this particular situation it sometimes it could be very kind of like intense you could feel things in a very intense way but you don't always show it externally which is especially something to consider because in our culture for anybody regardless of you know who you are inside we often don't encourage people to express how they really feel. We have a lot of rules about that that specifically say this is how you can express yourself Absolutely. at this particular time. So, you know, when you're at a, a, a handicap, a disadvantage, whatever word you want to use, everybody gets pushed aside and saying, no, you have to act this way regardless of how you feel. That is very true. <laughs> yeah, that is... Uh... Well, that's always kind of my one of my favorite themes to write about is that maybe because my brain is wired this way, I kind of I've always been, you know, very aware of the absurdity of the way people communicate with each other. You know, when you watch most movies, the characters often communicate in a very direct way, but that's not mm -hmm. usually what I see with the people around me. People are usually very indirect. People rarely say what they think or feel. And, you know, it's always very kind of, there are always several layers of protective language covering it up. So that's what I try to, that's what I try to do when I write is I try to accurately reflect the way people really communicate and conceal how they feel with each other. I think a lot of it boils down to with a movie, you generally have about 90 minutes for the character to say anything they want to say. And most, I mean, you know, you, most people have a day to day life and they have a lot of boring stuff in between. That's true. <laughs> so you, you can't have the boring stuff in a movie. So that that leads you to have to write an exciting, passionate, emotional line that most people really aren't going to do in their day to day lives. And that's. That can be confusing if you can't see the that's distinction. That's a challenge, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what Alfred Hitchcock said, is that drama is life with the boring parts cut out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that's, uh, that's nobody right. Nobody would know better than him, yeah. That's right, yeah. So what kind of movies do you like in your own life? This is horror. You just mentioned Hitchcock. Where do you really, what's your jam? Well, what my always my stock answer is always that I'll watch anything as long as it's good, and I mean that. But of course, there's some stuff that I gravitate more towards than others. I definitely I do like horror. I like suspense. I like comedy, especially dark comedy, and then I like anything that really kind of stimulates my imagination a lot. So you know, I'll watch you know different stuff like i try to watch you know kind of more unusual stuff sometimes and then i like you know and then i like you know, kind of the sci-fi and kind of mind-bending stuff too so i'm kind of all over the map but definitely you could kind of i i do kind of gravitate more toward certain things than sure. others okay so if you like dark comedy the, the one i have to ask because i love it and nobody else has seen it that i talked to have you seen u-turn with sean penn and jennifer lopez i have not seen that one yet i've you, heard of it 
put it on your list because it is a hilariously dark <laughs> comedy. Um, it's like, okay, the movie starts, the first 30 seconds, you see a bunch of vultures taking a roadkill apart on the side of the highway. Oh, cool. And it does not get better from there. Literally every human being in there has a horrible, horrible fate, and you're glad they do because they're all worthless pieces of garbage. And you will laugh so hard because well, I don't want to give anything away. But I'm just saying, if that's what you're into, I strongly recommend it. No, I'm, I'm going to check that one out now. Because I, I, I had seen it mentioned a few times on the internet, so that was somewhere on my list, but now it just shot up yeah. dramatically on my list of I, movies I've never watched. Heard of- Nobody's ever seen it before I mentioned to him. It's like, no, if you're willing to laugh at stupid, crazy, grisly stuff, see this movie. <laughs> okay, so you're, you've got this movie in the works, and you say you're, you're in the final parts of, of getting it put together. You want it released. What's your plan once it gets out on the market? Who are you hoping sees it if, if you have a target market at all? Well, my plan right now is to have an online premiere in November... And then after that, I'm going to try to get a distribution deal. I wanted to get, you know, Netflix and Amazon Prime would be my top, you know, choices because they have such a huge reach of people that that would get distributed to. But I would say that the target audience for this movie would be anybody who kind of likes these more kind of unusual, bizarre cult movies. I do think this has a lot of potential to become a cult classic although of course this isn't something you can do like on purpose ahead of time it has to become that way because people discover it mm-hmm. and then go to midnight screenings dressed up as the characters later but I could, yeah you're right you can't do it on purpose but i could definitely see something like that going in that direction because you know people like you and i we've got such a, a keen appreciation for when something is it hits that right note oh yeah <laughs> And it's like, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm looking forward to checking out that premiere, getting it any way I can. Uh, so how long is it? Well, it's uh, it's going to be about 100 minutes long, mm-hmm. so normal length for okay. movie. Well, we don't have any deleted scenes because it was done on a pretty low budget, so I made sure to milk every last dime we had. And it really looks, you know, I mean, some of the shots we have really look amazing and every time i watch it you know there are parts of the movie where i still feel mesmerized even though i've already seen it 10 different times in editing but it really it just sucks you in and you know you're you feel like you're right there with the characters and it's one hell of a ride i'm gonna talk about something that you might not want to offer a whole lot of insight on because you know you've got your behind the scenes stuff but for, for whatever answer you give you, are you looking at putting in any film festivals? Well, as of now, because of you know the whole pandemic situation, we're probably not going to do that because you never know if the festivals will meet physically or not mm-hmm. in the near future. But I'm definitely open to the possibility, depending on how things go for the rest of this year and early sure. 2021. Like I said, I knew that there might not be a firm answer there, but I definitely it, it's a great way to at, get to the right people, the people that are seeking out what you're you're looking at. Because, you know, you know, my neighbors over there, good people. When they queue up Netflix, they're not really looking for independent genre cinema. <laughs> I am, but I mean, you got to find the people. Yeah, like you got to you got to force it on them. Say, you know, mm-hmm. invite them over for like, hey, let's have a neighborly get together and be like. Oh, what's this? Oh, this is this is Fang. You know, oh, you'll like this. Mm-hmm, it's a mm-hmm. uh, it's the latest uh, blockbuster from director Richard Bergen. Yeah. <laughs> and if you say that, you're not technically wrong. You no, are the yeah. director. It's, it's a blockbuster by my standards. Exactly. <laughs> that word has never really meant anything, so why not use it to your advantage? Yeah, yeah. So this is this is the big new movie people are talking about. Well, which people? Yeah, uh-huh. the people. The people are talking about it. But Some people. <laughs> that, see, but this is truly what I enjoy about movies in this day and age is that you don't have to have that big release with the you know 
hundred million people, most of whom didn't really care about the movie at all. If you get the 5,000 people who think it's gold, you did your job. Absolutely. Well, that's what I've always been shooting for. Well, I need a little bit more than 5,000 to uh, make a profit, but 5,000 core fans who love the movie and are passionate about it, you know, that would make me a very happy guy. So do you have aspirations once this is in your rearview mirror, doing another movie, doing a series, continuing your film career? Oh, yeah, I have lots of uh, ideas for movies after this. I kind of realized at a certain point that I'm not going to be a hugely successful mainstream director, but I do believe I can sustain a career of making kind of these more unusual, bizarre, and dark kind of underground indie films. Mm -hmm. And don't rule out mainstream success. Oh, you never know. You never know. You know, when I was... I'm trying to be realistic. Sure, sure. You know, I I went like five years ago, you know, I was, you know, sitting in my room and fantasizing about walking down the red carpet and like being like, and the winner of this year's Academy Award is, you know, me. But I realized that, you know, you can't, you can't always shoot for that. So that's yet to accept, you know, when you hit your niche mm. and you find the people who are most passionate about your work, you don't always want to get too ambitious and lose what you had in the first place. Well, I mean, when I was a kid and by a kid, I mean, in my early teens, Kevin Smith was the big independent film person. He, he at the time, he was the only one who really got a lot of conversation in you know small town video stores and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And he, he was, in some ways, he was kind of a joke because he only made those weird genre movies that weird people like you and I watched. And now <laughs> these people are like, hey, do you want to write a Batman comic? Do you want to make a... He's being given these mainstream projects That's true. by big studios because he's just proven people like him. That's right, yeah. And, well, and, work, uh, everybody works their way up. Right. Eventually. And... and but, I'm just saying I'm not like, you know, I don't think you can necessarily determine where you'll be in 20 years time. Yeah. So for now, I'm, I have like, a, I'm, I'm sticking with my backup plan of, you know, all right, I'm going to keep making these kinds of movies. And if I become super successful, then that would be cool. But if not, I can be content doing this because this is a lot of fun. So are you, I can almost assume you're a fan of Lloyd Kaufman. Yeah, I, I've, I know him. Okay, so the guy who is great at not being paid for movies. <laughs> but, you know, you, you know, would that be a terrible thing if you follow in those foods? Just making movies you love, getting enough to make the next one, meeting a yeah, lot of good friends along yeah. the way? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that can, uh, yeah, that can, yeah, that's, that's kind of my current game plan. Just, you know, okay. keep sustaining what I already have and. And just follow where my instincts and inspiration takes me. All right. I can respect that. That That's really solid. Oh, thank you. I, I mean, I... <clears throat> so, are there any other people that you look up to? Because I've thrown out a couple names, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Well, I, I, do have, I do have a lot of different influences. And I think that, you know, as a filmmaker, the more influences you have, the better... Because if you're just ripping off one guy, then you're not going to be real fresh. If you're ripping off 10 or 20 different guys at once, that could be interesting. Mm-hmm. So so I think that I would say that the three directors that influenced Fang the most would be Alfred Hitchcock, David Lynch, and Martin Scorsese. Okay. I think the synthesis of those three styles, and then you wind up with something... Well, I don't, I don't want to, you know, talk myself up too much. <laughs> no, no, it's fair because you, 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 did, you were great in acknowledging that you're ripping off. And I, I say that in the most positive way possible because you're, you're taking honest inspiration from people who knew what the hell they were doing. That's so right. there's no shame in that. I, I would put that on your uh, as the poster on the premiere of your movie is like these guys made me want to do this. So, hey, if you can, again, add another couple of names to that next time around and, and do something different, that's fantastic. Well, thank you. Yeah. No, I uh, I have a lot of great people that I've been ripping off in my creative process. Hey, awesome. 
So do you have a social media presence where people can follow the this path that you're on now and, and the progress of your movie? I do, yeah. I have my uh, personal Facebook page for Richard Bergen, and then I have the Fang Facebook page, Fang colon the movie, which has a lot of pictures from it. And, you know, you, there's a lot of information about the movie on there, and it's just a really great resource, you know, for finding out more about it and, and seeing, you know, how our journey from, you know, filming through post-production and beyond. Awesome. Uh, well, I'm going to put that in the show notes of this episode, so if somebody wants to keep it tabs on you, they can link to it straight from there. My website is AaronBosick.com. And uh, anything else you want to add to the, the conversation while I have you on the line here? Well, I uh, I hope every I hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I hope you watch Fang, and I hope when you watch it, you have a fantastic time. I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> I hope you're putting on t-shirts when you get this thing made. Yeah, no, yeah, we're gonna. I, I, that's uh, my favorite Fang-related pun right there. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Well, Richard. Thanks so much for being here. I am looking forward to getting this out, and I'm looking forward to seeing your movie. Oh, you're very welcome, Aaron, and uh, thank you for having me on your show. It's been great. Glad to do it. Take good care.